So we're back. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, indulging me while I took a weekend off. Just got back from Taos, and boy, is my chakra tired. Wah, wah, wah. Um, I had a great week besides the trip uh, back from Taos, uh, or at Taos, and then back from Taos. I got a chance to meet with some friends, hang out a little bit. But also, last night, I got a chance to be involved in a bit of a salon type environment put on by Michael Theodore uh, where I got to both be introduced and reintroduced to some work of uh, local people that was really fun. I'll tell you if I could uh, offer any suggestions to you out there it's to find ways to interact with your local uh, musicians, artists, whatever because you'll find a almost bottomless well of inspiration from local folk. Without further ado, I now introduce you to this week's guest, Darius Semigan. Uh, what a treat. I hope you enjoy. All right, this week uh, I am very excited uh, to have a chat with uh, Darius Semigan. She is uh, currently a professor at SUNY uh, Stony Brook. Um, she's got a long history of compositions. You, you can find some on uh, some of the streaming sites like Spotify. You can find others. I actually ran into some really neat stuff on uh, the Boomcat distribution site. She's a really interesting uh, composer, first of all, because she has kind of composed across uh, much of the modern landscape, having uh, done some work back in the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Studios um, and having uh, worked uh, outside of that environment as well, having uh, worked in Stone, out of Stony Brook for quite some time, and uh, some really exciting work done there. But also she has a long history of not only studying composition, but being a teacher of composition. And I'm really excited to dive into that process as well. So let's say hi to Ms. Sim again. Uh, Daria, hi, how are you? Hi, Darwin. Uh, thank you very much for taking some time to talk to us. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you because uh, you have such a rich history and such a such a depth of information, so I'm anxious to kind of pull some ideas out of your head if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't we Why don't we start off by having you tell us a little bit about uh, about what you're doing right now? Well, right now I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's a reality. Um, I thought we were going to talk about uh, what was going on before or something historical. Oh, I think we'll do some of that, but I also want to make sure that people uh, understand that you're yeah. you're still a very active participant in the uh, music world. Uh, one of my recent works has to do with improv, with live instruments and electronic sounds, and hearing different performances um, of that, which means uh, being willing to take uh, the risk of allowing improvisation. At one point in, in uh, dealing with the instrumental part, I decided uh, um, the instrumentalists today are uh, somewhat different than people several, a number of years ago, let's say 25 years ago, who were not interest, that interested in improvisation or extended techniques or using, uh, daring to use their imagination and perhaps not always uh, conforming to what's going on in the score. So I wondered, what would a performer play if they were listening to the two electronic uh, sections that comprise my piece Bargello uh, for any kind of instruments uh, with electronic Sounds in two section pieces. So um, I found out. I invited people to try this piece out. And my curiosity was uh, what if I wasn't bossing the uh, performers around by means of a score, written, everything completely written out, or 
um, in such a way where I'm giving them a lot of hints about the, how to go about playing this thing. So I ask them to respond and collaborate with the sounds that already I had put together in these two sections of the Bargello work. And um, it's been played a number of times since uh, 2010. Uh, And for me, it's been quite revealing uh, in terms of the imagination that live performers apply to, uh, in, in their version of responding to that sonic soundscape or look that they are uh, trying to collaborate with. Sure. That sounds really interesting. Now, um, you are um, most well known as a composer, um, but you also have been teaching for quite some time, right? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit what you, about your path to becoming a composer, first of all? What did you learn first, and how did you expand that knowledge over time? To what extent were teachers and instructors or collaborators important in the process? How did that work for you? Um, When I basically um, uh, started writing after maybe my third piano lesson at a a rather young age, my main deal was I had... At the age of seven or so, I had no idea music was uh, written down in a score, um, oddly enough. So that became very fascinating from a graphic standpoint for me as a a child. And I started, I, of course, had to play the practice the piano and learn the pieces I was assigned, but also I was really bored with the types of exercise pieces um, I had to play at that level. So I started writing my own pieces uh, to the annoyance of my piano teacher. <laughs> but that's really that's really where it started. And I expanded into writing for ensembles and was lucky enough to study music theory privately with a uh, uh, a musician who was uh, the conductor of the regional orchestra and choruses. So this exposed me to um, ensemble music and string quartets and so on before I uh, landed in a music conservatory as an undergrad. Early on, were you sort of like fascinated by the inner or built-in logic of music theory? No. no. Um, I, that's not really why I compose. This, this is not, I think it's interesting to know music theory, to teach music theory, and to be able to apply it to analysis, and also to... Uh, in appreciation of uh, electronic pieces as well. Um, but I'm not composing in response to knowing music theory. That's really interesting because it seems like there there are a group of composers that are fascinated by the... I don't know. The I I don't know how to express that other than to just kind of say that that interlogic or interlogic or almost like puzzle making that is music theory. And then there are other uh, other people I've talked to have talked more in terms of having sounds or songs inside their head that they wanted to release. What if if it wasn't a response to music theory? What was the thing that drove you other than just boredom? What drove you into uh, wanting to write your own music? Liking sounds and going after certain sounds and being uh, excited by sounds rather than being excited by theoretical issues. Um, So it's all well and good that people have their own individual way as artists 
to be inspired and to become interested in different aspects um, of their experiences, academic and otherwise, um, and pursuing um, ideas. Sure, that, that makes is, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? I, I, uh, I do not require that students necessarily, people who are studying electronic music, uh, are not necessarily uh, professional musicians, and some of them don't uh, read music, but they can hear, and they listen, and they make interesting choices since the basic job of someone who is doing art is to choose. So these people have an intuitive ability, uh, regardless of whether they know music theory or not. Mm -hmm. And it's important to have these interests and intuition and self-feedback. The more naturally that this happens, uh, the more possible it is then to make interesting choices in putting together works. That's that's really fascinating uh, approach and a way to way to think about it. Now, um, in uh, in your own work, you actually in your early compositions, you were working at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center. One of your more famous pieces is called Electronic Composition Number no. One, which that was done at, at Columbia Princeton, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Except, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, what? <clears throat> can you tell us a little bit about what the process of realizing a composition was like in in those days? I mean, first of all, was that working with like analog systems and tape? Absolutely analog systems uh, and tape. There were no PCs available in 1971-72. And I actually started working in the medium myself um, around 1965 by putting together a um, recording of uh, uh, six instruments, live players who recorded some of spatial notation music I had written, um, and we recorded this on Ampex, old Ampex portable machines, which of course knew at the time (laughs) with microphones, and then spliced uh, the tape and kind of remixed the whole thing and made a sort of sonic collage. Then the performers played with that tape, so they played the same score, but the score had different flexibilities, so they could rearrange a little bit of the sequence of the patterns that they were playing, etc. So we kind of made a collage piece, and I was inclined to doing uh, this type of experimentation and working um, with recombining um, sounds. Um, at that time, or during, during those years, I had also heard a seminar with Henri Pousseur, who was talking about an opera he had uh, put together, and I found his approach to scoring and thinking interesting. So it's basically acquiring thinking tools and different perspectives and how one can approach putting together material. Um, also, uh, influence was the uh, very concise, incisive thinking of uh, and scoring of Ludoslavsky, uh, a non-electronic music composer. So uh, his his approach was interesting, and also, of course, because of the sound result, the sonic result was um, a very exciting outcome of this particular score for which he wrote uh, notation as a tool to get to the particular sound he wanted, he was aiming for. So... It, it was very interesting for me to... Oh, uh, I also of uh, influence was a seminar by Earl Brown, 
who brought some of his scores and talk about his approach. So it's um, thinking tools and ways um, that I could assemble, try out uh, putting together my own uh, scores or uh, electronic music files. Ways of working would be much more interesting for me than conventional uh, music theory uh, approach coming from that perspective. Yeah, it, it it makes sense because especially if your if if sort of the thing that drew you into composition was uh, enjoying sound and experiencing sound, putting yourself in the position to be the creator of new sounds had to be really exciting. I think the most exciting uh, thing about electronic music, right away from you, is the fact that the sound was accessible for me as a composer immediately, and I could react to it immediately and um, try out different combinations of sound and mixes uh, right there on the spot without waiting for performances of by live performers as I would have to uh, uh, with music score writing of the conventional sort. Right. So, so you were working with analog systems and tape. There was at the same time, roughly, there were people doing sort of like the early early computer music things. Uh, did you did you have a chance to ever play with those in their early days? Um. Well, um, I actually had uh, some experience with way back when using key punch cards and entire stacks of them to make, uh, uh, to then have the sounds converted from um, the analog tape, uh, uh, I should say from digital to analog and coming back to me on a gigantic uh, tape reel uh, on which I would hear things like bleep <laughs> uh, instead of an entire passage of music or several phrases that I had worked up. So I found it a very clumsy, non-spontaneous way of working for me to send information, let's say, uh, with a stack of key punch cards into a machine and getting uh, tape out of that, then having to have the tape converted um in a lab off uh, Columbia campus. Right. So it's a very clumsy way of working. This was not like working with software and PCs that right. we have to be assume. You know, we can work with our smartphones. We can, we have a lot of resources available. And in the 1970s and late 60s, you had silch. <laughs> Right. Well, I was just wondering because uh, it sounds like you. One of the things that's really important to you when you're working with uh, electronic systems is kind of the immediacy of hearing the sound, changing the sound, or making alterations. And uh, at the time, computer music was anything but interactive. So that that was not interesting to me. Also, it demanded too much specificity. And I like experimenting in various ways with sounds, um, kind of like painting on a canvas to uh, uh, have this sort of freedom rather than being tied to a lot of specifics that I'm obligated to stick with constantly. Uh, so this kind of uh, method did not work with me with the early technology. Absolutely. That makes sense. And again, the, the listening is extremely crucial. The availability of sound, very much the case as if I were a painter, I want to see uh, what I'm doing, the shapes, the colors, the textures, and then make choices on the spot. I wouldn't want to delay somehow my ability to respond to what I'm doing. So the spontaneity of that, very much, I guess, as 
one might do with performance. If you're an instrumentalist playing, you want you want to hear it right then, and you want to get yourself self feedback right then on the spot and be able to make the changes you need to shape the situation musically. Sure, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the themes that this this concept of choices is a theme that that's coming up a lot in our discussion. Mm-hmm. When yeah. um how how do you yourself how do you yourself make choices and how do you express the choice or a wise choice making process to your students? How how do you how do you do it and how do you help others do it? Well, first I typically will model by showing them where I make certain decisions and why. So I try to uh, show them, illustrate some basic thinking tools um, and describing situations um, regarding context. So what I'm doing is uh, typically associated with a particular context and how I would deal with, uh, let's say, a sound when it's in one context and then in another context. So everything, I will explain them to them in detail and they get some idea uh, on a uh, de- detailed level, nitty-gritty of what goes on in my thinking and responding as a kind of model example of working. Um, and they can go ahead um, and then do whatever they want with that information, use that as a model or expand and see how they um, go from there in developing their own ways of working and thinking, and then they share it with our seminar group. So it's very fascinating to see the ideas that um, young composers especially will come up with um, in terms of the things that they're looking to do and wanting to do and how what they actually end up with. And one of the things that I uh, emphasize is that people be reality-based in terms of uh, talking about sounds and even though we are uh, often composers writing program notes, let's say, uh, poetically about the music, that's simply a subjective response, of course, uh, important in its own ways, but some of that may be on the part of creators or makers somewhat of a wishful thinking situation. What I'm interested in is that actually happening in the music is what people say is happening actually there um, and not simply a more of a wish or illusion or self-delusion. So um, I think by keeping a uh, listening awareness, which is critical to working with sound, of course, um, and dealing uh, with that in a very aware way. This is a uh, truly um, accessing the way you're working, being aware. Um, I think that helps a lot. Um, It gives clarity to what's actually happening in the music. That's that's really interesting. So So do you have specific exercises that you use to help people uh, tune, fine-tune their ability to be, be uh, aware listeners? Um, I, yeah, definitely. One of the things that's important is evaluating the sound material that someone has already assembled. Usually uh, people are collecting, let's say, a sound collection or sound library they have. Um, of their own sounds that they've put together or recorded, and they're then trying to figure out how to start a piece 
or where to continue, at which point you continue with adding other sounds. And so I do a kind of sound appreciation evaluation where I listen to, say, snapshots of the material that they collect. And just to understand one snapshot um, and then have several, meaning really short sound uh, fragments and being able to hear everything that is in there uh, that is expressing, articulating, and which parameters, meaning which uh, elements are working, whether we are observing a pitch or a noise situation or the sounds are moving um, along a registral parameter um, or there is some other aspect going on such as uh, changing timbre and texture, which is uh, a very interesting uh, thing to be aware of, how you create textures, which for me, are, um, I think of fabric, uh, which is another way of expressing texture and how busy or not busy the elements that you are seeing um, are in pattern, in that pattern, and the consistency of pattern or less uh, rigorous consistency. Um, so sometimes I will also uh, show students different uh, works of art online and talk about those in terms of uh, density, texture, contrast, different things that are important to be aware of when you need them as thinking tools in understanding what's happening in your own music after you've got a few things, a few sounds for your piece and are trying to see what should happen next. You know what that reminds me of a little bit is that uh, kind of apocryphal uh, discussion about uh, a, um, I think it was a writing student who had trouble uh, putting together a, a written piece on her town. So the instructor said, well, why don't you do it on a specific building? And she still had trouble doing it. And then he instructed her to do it on one of the bricks in the wall on the building. And it was through that like intense, thoughtful interaction with detail that actually opened up a lot of the fountains of creativity then. Very, very well put. Good uh, illustration um, where attention to detail and increasing awareness and always being aware of sound and even aspects uh, like silence, where are they put in in a particular piece? How does it work? It really it affects psychologically what's happening in the delivery of the music and then our subjective response to that. Now, um, I, I'm curious about something. Since the sound and sound creation is really important to you, um, I can really understand we're working with systems that you completely control, whether it's a whether it's a synthesizer or I think you did uh, I think it was Rhapsody was done with uh, the MIDI grand pianos. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Yamaha MIDI grand, yeah. but it's it's unusual for me to work with a single system instrument because I prefer to uh, work with all kinds of sound modification done with a variety of machines. Right, I see. And so is that so is that where you because I notice a lot of your work is with either soloists or ensembles. And so is that is that part of the of the draw there that that those end up being more complex systems than well, uh, a machine would be? Okay, this is this is than what a machine would be. Um, no, I like the variety of expression in different machines and different gadgets, let's say different softwares. 
um, not necessarily a one machine thing. As far as my writing, um, virtuoso like solo instrumental pieces, uh, with those pieces, with a solo piece, I can delve in to much more detail. So it's about controlling details um, and a lot of expression because that's the reason for controlling details, to control these uh, expressions that are in the music. So um, I find there's less uh, of a certain kind of compromising when doing solo pieces. That is also true. In, I'm talking about instrumental music. But this is also true in electronic music where um, I do not have to deal with performances as much as I enjoy different types of performances of music. Um, I'm doing a piece that is more like a sculpture, a sound sculpture, and uh, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm spending time on it rather than uh, doing this in a real time setting because, in real time, for me, it would be as difficult as. Uh, Let's say I'm, I'm uh, an artist inviting people to a uh, art gallery exhibit, and I'm going to paint all the paintings and canvases in front of them. Right. Uh, that would not be possible for me to get into the uh, nitty gritty of the detail um, and the, the uh, expression, get the expressions that I want with the sound materials that I chose to use. That's actually a really fascinating metaphor because it works on so many levels. I mean, first of all, one of the things that happens when you would do like an exhibit in an art gallery is you get to do sort of like an additional level of editing, which is saying, of the things I've done, which are the things that, that maybe go together, which are the things that I would like to present in this environment. You get to, you get to have sort of like an extra level of editing that no real-time performance can do. Very good point also. So we're talking about this requires a certain amount of, of work and changing and changing your mind and right. adjusting. And even, even the lighting in the gallery is critical for how you see. Right. For me, when I'm dealing with layers of sounds and individual sounds in a context with other sounds and layers, I'm very aware of volume levels, that every time I have a register change or a timbre change, I'm constantly adjusting the sound's um, volume level. And when you do a tailored adjustment like that as a way of working, the sounds are heard uh, more in terms of their presence um, in your soundscape, and the music becomes um, a bit more robust um, sounding, more contoured. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about your process today. What are the tools that you work with at this point? Well, I'm dealing with, um, I have my library of various sounds, and to choose from, and I usually start with uh, listening to my material and choosing particular sounds to try out for a piece. So then I work on a uh, small section and see what happens with that. If I'm doing a composition um, in the studio that has no performers, I'm then free to do no performers or let's say dancers where the situation is connected and dependent on others um, mm -hmm. input. Well, when I'm just doing a piece, um, uh, let's say six media piece all by itself, then I can do whatever I want and that means um, I'm likely to experiment with uh, sonic situations that are interesting for me to try out. So um, I find that I have to be uh, interested in the sounds that I choose as well as 
in the process that I devised in order to make that particular piece. And my pieces are not all resembling each other um, in working method or the total outcome for each. So I tend not to uh, repeat the same system that I'm working with because I frankly not find it interesting to uh, repeat myself hmm. in, in my methods or thinking. So I find it's very natural to explore and experiment with electronic music um, that it's, uh, has uh, a huge uh, range of possibilities if you're interested in that kind of thing, including uh, working with improvisation and extracting situations, sonic situations from that. So it's really limited only by your imagination and thinking tools and how you apply these things to working on a piece. Right. Well, I'm... I'm curious a little bit about the tools because one of the things I'm getting from this conversation is that you really like kind of the elastic nature of sound and the ability to, to manipulate it at, you know, really greatly. And I'm curious to know what tools you're using to do that because it seems like they would have to be very uh, sort of like agile tools to be able to keep keep your interest or or well, do you or do you actually agile, I'm sorry go ahead the, the only agile tool going is one's brain uh, and I can work I enjoy working with all kinds of possibilities in terms of sound um, at one point during the uh, there's actually a piece I collaborated with uh, my colleague, Bilan Terrell, where we were uh, working on a score for an animation film, and we decided we were going to use a trill, which sounds just very pedestrian, but the trill we were getting from an auto automatic process from a Buchla machine or a Moog was sounding extremely mechanical. So we actually went through the trouble of recording sine waves and splicing them into a simple pattern, creating loops and creating a piece called True Study, which is a kind of coffee break piece <laughs> uh, with layers and all kinds of uh, uh, also stereo motion for these sounds. And, of course, the texture being very interesting with trills at a higher speed, creating this kind of uh, atmosphere. So that these things are also the dissensions on how you work. And in this case, this was 10 years ago, and you evaluate the quality of the sound. And as I said, the word mechanical popped up, and that this stuff was too mechanical, it's too predictable a pattern for right. us to be using. So we decided to modify, and this really is similar to uh, playing with live instruments because the variety in live performance is tremendous. That's why we have so many people pursuing it uh, and expressing live performance in their own way. So uh, this, uh, these kinds of additions of nuances of uh, all kinds with any type of of uh, hardware or software, analog or digital, can be done. And depending on how aware someone is in listening to their material and also their musical needs, what they notice, how they think about it, this, these are the um, thinking tools, the decision-making tools based on um, awareness. Yeah, the uh, coming back to awareness and making choices as a compositional technique. Yeah, it's really uh, it's really interesting how uh, your way of thinking about the composition process and and the actuality of composition 
is uh, kind of has this harmonious nature. That's that's really cool. Um, now, one of the things that uh, tends to be an output, you know, uh, tends to be an output for composers is a score. Prior to starting the thing, we were talking a little bit, and you mentioned that you're not really married to the process of creation of a score. Is that correct? Not with electronic music. Right. Do you use any other devices to help coordinate things, or is it really an experimental and at-the-moment process? Well, when I'm working on a piece, I'm dealing with um, choosing sounds. It goes to basically listening and choosing and working with material that I've collected <coughs> uh, for, the purpose of, for the purpose of doing that piece. Right. You know, I don't have any other tricks or gimmicks or whatever um, extra. and I don't need uh, a score if I'm not depending on musicians uh, realizing a score, meaning playing a score. Um, and I certainly don't need... Um, in fact, in years ago, when the copyright laws were such that they did not um, accept um, a sound recording for copyright, then studio composers would basically make a sort of abstract diagram or scribble on a sheet of paper and put their name on it with the title of their electronic piece and send that in because they, people still had this concept that a score would not be just a recording. Yeah, a score um, was a prelude to a performance, right? And you had to have some, something uh, written down. So that hasn't been the case for quite a while, but there's no reason for me to have a score if I have no use for it in terms of making a um, sound sculpture, let's say, for which I don't have a live performer. Sure. Uh, when you do work with live performers, what, what do you create for a score? I ask this because I had a really interesting discussion with Pauline Oliveras a few weeks ago. And she kind of described her uh, textual scores as a, mecha a mechanism for her to express um, a feeling that couldn't really be notated, but could be expressed through words. And I thought that was that's one really interesting way of doing uh, of doing scoring of a piece. What when you're sharing your your work, or when you're going to have performers do your work, what do you provide them from a standpoint of a score? Oh, I usually get more specific with a, an instrumental score in that type of uh, instrumental music composition because I like to choose um, how the sounds are made by these instruments and when they are made and how they uh, come together um, in group. So, yeah, um, again, it's all based on choosing. An uh, artist's job is to choose. Right. So you choose your tools, your methods, and make your decisions um, in what kind of uh, product you want to get creatively, ultimately. So now I get that, that you're able to sort of like set the plate for performers. Now, you mentioned um, that some of your recent work has kind of brought improv improvisation uh, into the, the game as well. How do you balance the desire to make choices and to sort of like design a soundscape um, and still allow still allow improv by the performers? I guess I, this is something that I, as for my own composition, I struggle with because I really like the energy and stuff that improv brings. But it's sort of like, but I, but I really want to kind of control the mechanism too. How do you, how do you deal with that dual nature? Well, yours is a very interesting question and consideration. I think one, uh, it really depends on your thinking uh, in dealing with situation. I have uh, wanted to compose the electronic. Uh, the two electronic uh, sections of the piece, which are, let's say, contrasting movements first. 
So I wanted to make uh, two established short electronic pieces that would be in uh, a set. And they could be played in, in either one of them could be the first piece or the second piece of the set. So any order. And I decided that instead of my bossing around the performer, <laughs> we have very interesting performers these days who can tackle improvisation in an original way. And I should also say that a lot of the material, the way I got my sonic material, especially the more complex areas of it, had to do with improvisation as well. Uh, so there's improvisation that I did in terms of arriving at different mixes of material, and then ultimately I had to choose from that how I was going to organize the sounds for each of the two sections of the piece. So I decided if I can do this, let them uh, contribute what they what their uh, musical reactions may be to hearing the sounds that I put together. So it's basically a response situation. And in my instructions to performers, I write that they should be sonically responding, not imitating, but have a connection to the sounds that they are listening to from my piece from the electronic side. Mm -hmm. And this could be any possibility. If they want to do something contrasting, uh, they can go ahead and do that or imitate in any way. It's any of these variation techniques that typically are done in any sort of music, or for that matter, art, um, that people tackle and apply and see how it works. And since these are professionals who know their instruments very well, instead of my bossing them around about performance, I wondered what the hell they would play, (laughs) given the choice of hearing these sounds that are already there on a recording and see how they would respond. And so far it's been very interesting for me because... Every time the piece is played, it's somewhat a different piece with perhaps different instruments and a different approach in delivery of instrumental. So it's a piece that is in different versions depending on the performer that Pascal is playing it. Well, thank you so much for being really open about your process and about kind of your methods. I think it's sometimes hard or it can be hard for people to talk about that stuff directly. It seems like, I don't know, it seems like I'm asking you to tell me how you wash your clothes or something, right? It seems somewhat (laughs) intimate, but um, at the same time, I think it's the kind of thing that helps that helps other artists understand what they're doing or what they could be doing to make their work better. Um, Do you have any hints for budding artists, composers uh, of whatever sort? Do you have any any suggestions for people? Uh, Well, usually my suggestions are based on the individual situation on how they're working and uh, what their ideas may be and what questions they would have. So I don't have any global nature uh, advice as much uh, in terms of creative work. Well, I do think, though, that your ideas of uh, about... um listening awareness in listening and the choice making process i think that actually gives everybody some good material to to work with uh i want to thank you so much for taking uh taking the time out to do this interview it was uh as enjoyable and wonderful as i had hoped so thank you so much for taking the time to do this 
My pleasure, Darwin. Thank you. All right. Um, and with that, I'm going to sign off. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And um, I hope to talk to you again soon. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So there you go. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed uh, listening to that. It was really fascinating to talk to Daria. Was a really important composer and innovator, uh, in especially in the electronic music space, but in composition in general. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to again thank uh, everyone out there. I want to th- especially thank uh, Meg Shadell who helped put this interview together. Uh, she's been a real friend of the podcast and real great uh, helper in terms of pulling together interesting and wonderful people uh, to for me to interview. Um, I also want to again thank uh, Cycling74. They put out a nice little uh, social media blast for me earlier in the week that uh, got some nice traffic and I just always appreciate their willingness to support me in doing this podcast. And I want to thank you, the listener, for being there. Uh, the great comments I get in email, uh, which is, by the way, ddg at cycling74.com or darwin.gross at gmail.com is another option. But in any case, uh, I, it's always great to hear from you all. If you want to uh, hit me up on Facebook, you can... Uh, do Darwin Gross. Uh, remember, there's an E at the end of that name. Um, otherwise, uh, email is always great. Or just follow the podcast website and uh, you'll stay in tune. But otherwise, thank you very much for uh, your support. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye.